Thanks, Lindsay. Um, thanks to all of you for being here. I'm so excited to see you all. Um, thanks to uh, everyone who helped us make this afternoon's lunch session happen. Thanks to Mac for um, really putting up with uh, me during a very busy time. All of your support has really been um, so wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, these conversations have been great. Uh, what you're seeing now is a, a slide from my um, small part of our plenary conversation this afternoon, just a few minutes ago. Um, I joked that um, this robot conveys something about my feelings. Um, I am Allison Thomas. I am beginning work as the Assistant Dean for Academic Integrity. We are now a centralized space. Um, and so I'll begin by asking for uh, your patience and I will continue by asking for uh, energy questions, feedback, um, not just right now, but um, throughout the semester. My email is here, a Thomas at American. You can get in touch with me at any time. Uh, I'm hoping to make a lot of time for questions today, but if you don't feel like asking them right now, you need to sit on it, think about it. Um, you can always get in touch. Um, this is my real slides, the real title, Artificial Intelligence and Academic Integrity. Um, my goal is really to give you as much adv advice and guidance as I can today, knowing that um, my expertise is only in some areas and not others. Um, and so hopefully, whatever questions you ask me, I can continue uh, researching and learning about um, and uh, continue these conversations um, over, the, over the coming year. Uh, so I mentioned that the Office of Academic Integrity is new. Uh, we started officially on August 1st. Um, and so we've hit the ground running. We visited, I, I see a lot of faces that we visited already, or a lot of names of faces that uh, we visited with already. Um, Alexis Glasgow, you may know uh, from her work in UEAS, has joined us as the first Academic Integrity Coordinator. Her work will be primarily student-facing. Um, and Jacqueline Reynolds from OGIS uh, will be our assistant director. Her work will be primarily faculty facing. And then Tamara Alsala is an administrative coordinator for us. She'll be doing a lot of work with scheduling and communications and planning, hopefully what will be a year of really exciting events. Um, but really our work is focused on three main things. No big deal. We are going to adjudicate all cases centrally. So anytime there's an academic integrity issue that comes up across the university, with the exception of the Washington College of Law, um, we will be uh, handling that in a central location. Um, that is uh, with, with an eye on fairness and consistency across the university, but also with the goal of providing more robust support and guidance. So that's our second goal, um, is getting started by um, talking to faculty, talking to students, talking to staff, and figuring out um, what are best ways to sort of support um, not just artificial intelligence questions, um, but all academic integrity related work across the university. Um, and then the third thing uh, to launch the next phases of our academic integrity code uh, revision process. Um, over the next year, I'll be asking for a lot of feedback, comments and participation in, in that process. So I hope that you'll consider um, joining that effort. Before I talk about some of the specific um, concerns about artificial intelligence tools and academic integrity, I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of terms that people are using. Um, some of them people are using interchangeably, either um, in, to, in my understanding correctly and sometimes not correctly. Um, I'm going to use the term generative AI. And what I mean when I say generative AI is um, a tool that's drawing from an enormous um, set of data that is in general uh, available uh, through, through the web. And the tool is able to sort of generate things from that, that base of, of data. Um, I know that's a really sort of rudimentary way of explaining that, um, but the technology areas are not my areas of expertise, something I've learned a lot about uh, in the past, really in the past year or so. Um, one of the things a lot of faculty, students, and staff has have asked me about is whether or not we have a policy. If you are at the lunch, you'll recognize this slide because I mentioned it. And um, our colleague Betsy Cohn, who's joining us today, um, uh, asked me the sort of elephant in the room question about whether we have a policy. Um, and the answer is we have an academic integrity code that we're using for the next year. And there are parts of that code that get at some of the concerns that 
artificial intelligence tools, generative AI can raise. So some of those tools have limitations and problems that students may or may not be aware of um, that kind of run afoul of the policy that we currently have. The two that I've seen most commonly uh, in the past, um, since the sort of middle of the spring semester, are these two, ones that involve fabrication of data. So you've probably heard that tools like ChatGPT uh, and other generative AI tools that collect, find, produce research uh, may be producing um, invented or um, false sources that look real. They might be titles of real journals. They might be articles that sound like they exist. They might even be real scholars, but they don't uh, actually, they're not actually um, real research. This, if a student is using a, a citation for a source that doesn't exist, this is an academic integrity question and should come um, to our office. We're here to help when these kinds of questions come up. The code also notes that all papers and materials submitted for a course must be the student's own original work. And so if uh, if we're seeing that a student is using uh, this these tools, generative AI tools to produce work that they should be doing themselves, this could create an academic integrity issue. Of course, there are lots of questions that come up about that related to the kinds of evidence that um, support those claims. Uh, and we'll talk about those in a second. Those are the kinds of uh, ways our policy gets at some of the concerns that we have about generative AI. But obviously, uh, that that furthers <laughs> that furthers our questions. Is that policy enough? Um, should the university be coming up with a singular policy that applies to everyone? Is a one size fits all um, approach going to work for us? Um, and the approach that I've taken at this point is that one size fits all is not going to work. We have colleagues across the university who are using um, generative AI tools in a variety of ways. We have offices across campus who are supporting students in various ways where um, generative AI is finding a space. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is offer uh, some um, direction towards shared language, um, towards collegial conversations amongst those who teach what you teach or do what you do to develop um, shared objectives, and I'm using sort of local in a, in a colloquial way there, but orient your policy to the learning outcomes of your courses or to your programs or to the work that you're doing. What are you hoping that students get out of this experience? Can you use that to direct how you will um, make statements about generative AI, what you will say, and how you'll explain the sort of why to students? Can you be clear and transparent about what's okay and what's not? and why, um, connecting to disciplinary standards or standards of, um, of professional spaces um, is really useful for students and also for groups of, of faculty and staff to consider. Um, and then the ethical implications and choices um, is something that I think students have not thought a whole lot about and want very badly to think about. Um, I've had some re really exciting conversations with students in the past couple of weeks, and they really want to talk about artificial intelligence. They really want to talk about um, the ethical implications. They, they often haven't been made aware of how the tool works and the ways it might do things like extend biases or um, further stereotypes that, um, that these tools are kind of drawing from data that potentially contains those biases or stereotypes. I do want to tell you, um, I don't know if there are some amongst us who are thinking, well, I didn't, I didn't really think this was going to be an issue, or I don't think any of my students are using this stuff, or, um, or this isn't really happening at AU. Um, maybe there are some amongst us who are feeling that way. And I, so I did want to tell you, yes, I have seen this. Yes, it has come up in terms of academic integrity uh, in the spring um, quite a bit. And it's not just ChatGPT. I think it's important to mention that that's just one type of generative AI tool. There are so many, they're constantly changing. I couldn't make a list of all of them um, if I tried and some of them you know, might not exist tomorrow or like Elon Musk will buy them and they'll be called something else. Anyway, um, so the ones that I saw uh, used in the spring by students, ChatGPT of course, but Quillbot, which is a paraphrasing tool um, and what I put in quotation marks here are the kind of taglines or the advertising text that students are seeing. Um, 
Sight, which is marketed as ChatGPT for science, um, focused on collecting um, scientific research. Um, Illicit, this is a really popular one. Um, the AI research assistant, um, collecting research and um, uh, helping students do things like compile a bibliography. Grammarly, many of you are probably familiar with. A lot of our students use Grammarly. I know some of our support teams have presented Grammarly as a useful tool. Um, and I'll, I'll use that to point out, none of these are necessarily bad tools. I really don't wanna get into sort of, this is inherently bad, this is inherently good. Um, but uh, Grammarly has remarketed itself as a kind of AI powered writing assistant. And that kind of helps us to think critically about when it's okay to use Grammarly versus when it's not. These are questions that students really need to um, be focused on. I'll get to that in a second. Um, word tune, uh, rewriting to avoid plagiarism. So doing things like paraphrasing and summarizing. Um, and then for coding, GitHub Copilot, um, your AI pair programmer. Those are the, those are the ones that I saw um, used in cases I saw in the spring. I also thought it'd be relevant to tell you um, what I heard students saying about these tools in the spring um, in various contexts. So sometimes in the context of uh, academic integrity concerns and conversations with me about potential violations, and sometimes in the context of visits to student groups who wanted to really talk about this. Um, time is an issue. Everybody knows this, but this is one of the things students point to as a reason, uh, sometimes what they see as a justifiable reason to turn to specific technologies. I ran out of time. I didn't understand the reading. Um, I put the reading, I pasted the reading into ChatGPT to get it to explain uh, the text to me. Um, I use it for structure. This was a really common one. I didn't know how to structure my paper or my project. And so um, I gave it some of my ideas and asked it to come up with a structure or an organization scheme for me. Um, I don't get why this is a pro a lot of students are sort of like I didn't get why this is a problem. Uh, these are my ideas. It's just moving them around or fixing them or doing a kind of cosmetic um, uh, fix on them. Um, similar approaches to source finding. And so I don't know if there are any uh, librarians or if information literacy scholars among us, but for me, um, I, cr I cringe as I learn um, that the sort of like finding sources is uh, this, 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 um, the assignment required 10. And so I asked it to give me 10 and I put the 10 in the paper. Um, really reflects uh, a lot of things about how our students think about research. Um, and then I use it to help me get ideas for brainstorming. Um, and maybe some of you saw, uh, this article in the Chronicle of Higher Education written by a student uh, about, about the ways students are using, uh, this, this writer focuses on chat GPT particularly. Um, but when I read it on May 12th, uh, my thought was that checks out. Um, this article I think represents a lot of the comments that I've seen and a lot of what I've learned about how students are thinking about these tools and using them. So I wanted to mention um, a few uh, challenging questions here. Um, when does artificial intelligence use, the use of generative AI on a project potentially become an academic integrity case? Um, the most straightforward thing I can say is that uh, if, the, if the, the submission is using fake sources, that is you look at the citation, you click on a link, it doesn't exist. You try to find the source, it doesn't exist. This is um, a time to call me. This is a time to call our office. Um, the use of um, sources that don't exist is a potential academic integrity um, problem. The last five here are more complicated because um, they may or may not be enough to sort of generate uh, the need for our office to get involved or to take a deeper look. Um, but some of the things that might inspire you to think about what to do in your courses, and uh, Betsy Cohn will talk about this uh, in her session later that will follow this in terms of assignment design, but uh, questions about process work. So if a student's submitting something that um, doesn't seem to be informed by the prior process elements that you saw, if a student is not able to talk about the contents of the work they submit or their process for creating it, if the, the voice or tone is really different from their previous work, if the work doesn't meet the prompt or the assignment, um, if the submission is sort of disconnected from the course, the text, the discussions, et cetera, 
And I wanna say very clearly that these five things don't themselves mean that there's a code violation or that there should be an academic integrity case. Um, they're just things that have kind of informed some of the, um, the concerns that we've, that we've fielded. So it's something to consider, it's something to bring up with us if you're seeing any of these things. Um, and it's something to potentially consider adapting or adjusting for as you design your materials. Um, I do want to note that um, originality detectors exist freely on the web, but also through our subscription to Turnitin. Um, it would take another whole session for me to talk about how I, how I feel about um, the Turnitin use of the originality detector. Um, but for now, I'll just say that um, if most, most experts agree that these detectors are not reliable. We cannot understand how they work. They work on algorithms that we can't see um, or access, um, so they're not transparent. Um, and we at AU are not using these as sole determinants to pursue AIC matters at this point. Um, and in fact, I feel like, uh, in my view, they potentially create an adversarial relationship between the faculty member. There's a sort of um, challenge to referring to them, um, th those scores in general. Um, I also heard from a student this morning uh, who mentioned to me that uh, she and her friends were so concerned about their work being flagged for using uh, artificial intelligence tools that they uh, would paste their work into these gener these originality detectors to see if it flagged anything and then would make changes accordingly, even though they did the work themselves. Um, and so I think this sort of gets at a level of anxiety and confusion and um, and, and really fear about um, that students have uh, about this at this point. Um, I want to offer some syllabus language and note that um, I'm not going to present examples as requirements I'm not suggesting that there is a blanket policy that everyone has to adhere to. I recognize that some people will want to use generative AI tools in meaningful ways in their courses. I encourage you, if you're going in that direction, to think about how those connect to or help you further your learning outcomes. Um, so if you want students to use a tool like ChatGPT, think about why, think about telling them why, and think about how it helps you further your, um, your learning goals in the class. Um, this is a sample uh, of, of mine. You're welcome to use it. You're welcome to pull from it, adapt it. You can do whatever you, you want that makes sort of sense for you. Um, the, this kind of draws from uh, the thing that I always tell students when I visit, which is that the spirit and the, the heart of the academic integrity code is really that you, the academic project rooted in you submitting work that's 100% your own 100% of the time, unless you're acknowledging in some way uh, th that you're doing otherwise with a citation or something that's appropriate for the discipline or situation. Um, and so if a student feels like they need technology in a particular way or they need to use a tool like ChatGPT, I'm encouraging them to talk to faculty about it. I recognize that um, faculty don't always know these specific tools or how they work. Um, and so if a student says, you know, I use this tool, is that okay? As a faculty member, it's okay to say, let me write that down and take a look at it and see. And then the question is, does this contribute to our learning outcomes or does this present a shortcut for the student through uh, or around the learning outcomes rather than through them? And so um, you'll see in some of my language here, I'll go to the next one. Um, what's, what's really kind of in these is this question of shortcuts and substitutes. So if the technology is substituting for the learning you expect to be happening in the class, if it's creating substitutes for the student to do work and execute skills that you're hoping to teach and you're hoping for them to practice, um, then it might not be appropriate. And that's a way you might think about um, explaining that in your materials, uh, in your conversations and in your assignments. Um, I also heard from students this morning who said that um, they had a class in which, in the spring, in which two thirds of the students uh, generated papers, projects using uh, an, a generative AI tool. When the faculty member found out, uh, they wanted to give the student another chance to submit, the students another chance to submit the work, and had some really deep conversations about these concepts. And students, the students were focused on the, on 
their excitement about the faculty member engaging on these topics and on really learning and teaching rather than the sort of telling oriented statements that come from a syllabus. And so I think that emphasizes something for all of, of us to consider, which is um, something that's been true for academic integrity work always, which is putting a statement in your syllabus is a start, um, but it is by no means enough. If we really expect students to think deeply about these things and navigate some really complex um, information ecosystems, help ecosystems, um, academic citizenship ecosystems um, in, meaningful, in meaningful ways. Um, the idea that students should be able to talk about the work they submit, both sort of the contents and the process for creating it is really important. And I wanna emphasize that the goal there is not accusation as in I need to make sure you can talk about this so I have a stronger um, cheating accusation, but rather the pedagogical significance of having a conversation with students about their work and telling them in the syllabus, I'm gonna expect you to do this. I'm gonna wanna see your research. I'm gonna wanna talk to you about what's in this document. Um, I'll also point out, uh, I'll, I'll link you up with uh, the work in progress SharePoint uh, for academic integrity that has a bunch of resources, a bunch of language and a framework for language that kind of um, categorizes ways people might use a, a generative AI tools. Uh, syllabus language when uh, you wanna kind of be restrictive about the use of those tools syllabus language when you want to be sort of open to it, uh, syllabus language for when you want to be um, a little a little more um, sparing about it. And so there are a number of universities who have established that kind of framework. And so there are some examples in the SharePoint I'll show you. Um, but Lance Eden created this Google Doc. It's a collection of classroom policies that folks have pasted in. It's, it's, um, it's interesting to look at the variety um, of, of policies that are oriented to specific classes and really to compare kind of how does this class versus this class um, attend to academic integrity uh, issues in relation to AI. Um, and I wanted to use this example. Um, most of the presentations I design at this point are done using PowerPoint. I accept a lot of the designer's recommendations. Sometimes I use uh, Canva and the magic design is something I also use. Uh, and so I thought about that as an example um, of sort of my decision making in doing that. Um, I assumed that in coming to talk to you today uh, that no one was going to uh, attend to see my PowerPoint design prowess. I mean, I know that I have some cool pictures um, and I did choose those myself, um, but I didn't design these slides and I didn't think I'd be evaluated, judged, or kind of, um, or, or that I was providing content towards those things, right? And so this language here is from a graphic design course, learning outcomes from Oregon State University. And you can see that this graphic design course is interested in um, students learning about how to apply tools and technology in distributing visual messages. And so if I were in that class, uh, I probably wouldn't want to use something like Drop Deck, which it helps you create slides, or Beautiful AI, which makes presentations for you. Would I want to use Canva's magic design? Would I want to use PowerPoint's designer? Those things might sort of offload the skills or concepts that I should be learning as a student in this class. And so this is an example of, I think, something that's worth describing to students that I'm going to uh, restrict your use of chat GPT, for example, in this course, because part of what we're learning is um, in contradiction to sort of um, what that tool offers or the limitations that tool um, sort of presents. So I think connecting to learning outcomes is sort of the way to help students take the long cut really through this instead of, um, instead of using a shortcut. And recognizing that there are times when shortcuts can work depending on the context, right? Um, there are times when uh, it's okay to use a cal calculators are always the example people give when talking about AI. It's okay to use a calculator because I know how to add stuff and I need to do this efficiently. I'm gonna use my calculator. Um, but if I don't know how to add, uh, then the use of the calculator uh, is a substitute for uh, knowledge or skills that uh, someone probably expects me to, to have. 
So instead of giving you language and saying, you have to use this, or this is the university's policy, or this is the language I wanna require in all of your syllabi, I'd like to give you some questions that I hope you'll think about for your own language uh, and for your work with colleagues uh, who, who you, you know, who do the same thing you do, do something similar to what you do, who are in your cohort. Um, what specific tools are students permitted to use in your class or in your context? Um, what do you expect students to do when they need help? What are reliable and responsible sources of help? Remember that students' definition of help is probably really different from ours. And there's a lot of stuff online that markets itself as help that when I read about it or see it, I'm like, that's not help. Um, and so asking that question and addressing that, um, addressing that concern about responsible sources of help um, is really important. Um, what kinds of conversations are happening in your field, in your discipline, in your professional space um, about artificial intelligence and about generative AI tools? Um, I think this is really interesting and, um, and important for students to recognize that this isn't just in our classrooms, this is everywhere. Um, what do our learning outcomes tell us about what tools are appropriate? And what does it mean to use a specific tool responsibly? So not just how to get help responsibly, but if there's a specific tool um, to mention that you know sort of in this area students might be likely to use, um, you, wanna, you wanna get at that. And I recognize that there's AI at work in other professional spaces. And in some professional spaces um, that's been, um, that's, that seems to be more acceptable depending on the, the standards of the profession or the um, or the group has have decided um, in those in those areas. And so things like the Career Center, um, Academic Support and Access Center, uh, Writing Center, there are there are concerns that might be slightly different than what we're talking about today. And so I hope that as a community, we can sort of work together to help students think about how the academic values that involve academic integrity kind of inform work in other contexts. Um, so things like job applications, um, resumes, community-based learning opportunities, things like that. Um, the Academic Integrity Code, of course, only covers academic work. That is work that's done um, for academic credit. Um, but I do think that these tools um, raise really important questions across contexts about ethical implications um, and about being responsible in, in making choices. And in particular, I think that the concerns and topics uh, uh, that have to do with privacy and security, intellectual property, data ownership, um, bias, um, fake or misleading content, false attribution, um, all of these things are our students really want to talk about and are um, topics that, that anyone can engage students on. This, the photo I include here is from uh, UC Santa Cruz uh, news, news outlet that reports on some of their faculty researchers who are um, looking at bias and generative AI models. Um, this one in particular is looking at a text to image tool uh, that when you type in um, science generates pictures of um, boys doing science. Um, and so something like these kinds of uh, questions uh, get us to think about um, our, our own part in uh, the ways some of these tools could be furthering um, uh, issues, uh, bias related issues. Um, I have some resources in the SharePoint also about citation and acknowledgement. Um, there are scholarly and professional journals that have developed policies on authorship and use of specific generative AI tools. I would recommend looking at those for your area um, to see if there are statements you can draw from, work in, refer to, um, invite students to think critically about. Um, there are citation style guidelines. Um, I've put a couple on SharePoint um, of, the, of um, Chicago, MLA, APA, um, and I'll have more up there um, by the end of the week that connects us to LibGuides, um, the AU um, library's um, subject guide on citation, but then other LibGuides that kind of look to be like they're tracking various organizations' responses and policies. And so kind of trying to use those as ways to keep up with what um, different professional organizations and scholarly projects are saying about these things. Um, a lot of people wanna make sure they know what to do if something comes up. Um, and I, I want to make sure that you know that um, the Office of Academic Integrity, despite being new, is, um, is, is here to help. And reporting a case um, is, is um, 
should should not be um, something that anyone's kind of nervous about doing. Um, our initial conversations with faculty are confidential until they're not, in which case we let you know they're not. Um, if we're going to open a case, um, then then we take that work on, um, and you can uh, carry on with your work in the classroom. Um, we do have standards of evidence that um, we have to hold to in. Uh, dictated by the academic integrity code. They're high standards of evidence and we're, that's not gonna change. And so sometimes there are situations where uh, you might call and say, I think the student had a robot write this paper. The, the robot did this person's homework. Um, and our office might ask a bunch of questions. And in the end, we might say, I'm not sure this meets our standards for evidence to create a case. Can you have a conversation with the student? Can you ask the student some questions? Can you work with the student to sort of figure out what's going on here? Um, and we can provide some guidance for those conversations, but overall faculty shouldn't be making accusations related to academic integrity. Conversations, different, um, but accusations or allegations or penalties that a faculty member would want to impose for academic integrity reasons um, are, are indications that you should call us. Faculty are not permitted according to this code to penalize a student based on the perception they've, used, they've uh, violated the academic integrity code. So if you see a paper and you're like, these sources are all fake, I'm gonna give it an F and call it a day. Um, you, should not, you should not do that. And if you do, the student has a potential um, grievance to file in that situation. So if you see something, um, give us a call. We can, we can talk you through that. Our main faculty contact is Jacqueline Reynolds, as I mentioned, her email is here. Um, and we'll just be doing more conversations and workshops as much as we can throughout the fall and spring um, to, to support you and to respond to some of the questions and concerns that are coming up sort of as you're seeing them um, as a way to be sort of more proactive about these things than, um, than reactive. Um, and I'll mention uh, the SharePoint site and sort of reiterate um, my uh, request at this time for sort of patience, our new office um, is working to make this as robust as we can and recognize too that this is a kind of holding pattern site as we build um, more robust tools. But I do think um, it's a place where I'm gathering as much as I can to offer as, um, as you work out syllabus and assignment design. Um, if you have things that you'd like to see on this site, if you have ideas for any part of it, I hope you'll let me know if you want to get involved in any of the academic integrity issues I mentioned today, um, including building a new code. I hope you'll get in touch. Um, I'm a Thomas at American.edu. My email is sort of all over. Um, I'm, 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 I'm around. Please find me. Please call me. Um, I'm really excited about this work. I, I can't wait to sort of work with you more um, on these on these issues. Um, and I also my final slide will say, um, please join us in session 801, which is um, led by Betsy Cohen, that kind of takes this conversation further into pedagogical implications for our teaching. So I hope um, I'm, I'm sorry for sort of doing a lot of talking at you. I know Betsy's session will involve more um, interaction and opportunity to kind of digest some of this, but I wanted to make sure that I um, took some time to offer you everything I can. I threw the kitchen sink right at you. So thanks for your patience. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your interest in all of this. And I'm looking forward to working with you, to hearing uh, your questions. And I will, I will stop right there. going to stop sharing my screen. And then um, if there are questions, um, I can take a look at the chat or um, if Teddy or Mac wants to um, moderate, either way is fine by me. Yeah, um, I just have a slide to share with a link to the like the QR code for the evaluation. Um, but yeah, you can answer questions as I share that. Great. Thanks. Um, I, I'm looking at the chat and I see, um, I see Karan's hand. I will, I'll start with Karan and I'll uh, scan through the chat too. Hi, Karan. Hello, my friend. How are you doing? Hi. 
I just have a comment and then a question. Um, the comment is just to give you such a shout out for the summer that you've had. Um, myself personally and our office has been the recipient of some of your uh, inquiry-minded collaboration. And it's been such a pleasure to work through with you and Jacqueline um, these issues and your openness and your curiosity and um, no. your your focus really is on how are we all thinking critically about this? And, and I can't say enough about that approach and how excited I am to share it with the 48 peer consultants that I have uh, in the Center for Professionalism Communications as we all kind of try to make meaning together. So thank you so much for that. And a question, uh, it's, it's um, really unfair, I feel like, to diminish the power of the conversation with a student when, when something isn't right and when things are suspected um, that have to do with academic integrity. And I'm not saying anybody is, say, is diminishing that, but um, we had a situation in a class I teach where uh, one of our students fabricated having been in an activity and fabricated everything around that activity. Um, and myself and my co-instructor just had this person come in and talk to us. And I think hearing later that this person, the student was so surprised by our kindness and concern about how did we miss this or were we wrong or and our humility that they completely caved and said that they had fabricated, uh, it wasn't a chat GPT case, it was just an academic integrity case. My question is, um, we didn't report that, even though it was clearly, you know, a submitted paper that had fabricated evidence in it. Do, do we get in trouble for not doing that? Um, or, or can we consider it kind of settled that the student learned from it and, um, and it was kind of all figured out. Thanks, Gran. That was a great question. Thank you also for your kind words. I've really enjoyed working with your team um, as well. Um, it's a great question. So our code right now allows faculty to have these conversations with students as long as they're not applying penalties to the work. So students are entitled to a kind of due process. They get to respond, they get to contribute, they get to participate in the process of deciding this is a code violation, the outcome is this. That's a process that's established and, and um, kind of codified in, in our AIC. If a professor is saying, let's have a conversation about this, I wanna talk about these issues, I wanna go through some skills or ideas or concepts, and I want you to practice this, resubmit the work, no grade penalty. That is an okay thing to do. Um, and I think this also gets at the point of sort of figuring out sort of where the learning happens best or most. And I think as a faculty member myself and thinking about some of the conversations I've had with other faculty, I wanna make sure that this whole process reflects the authority of faculty to determine the zone of teaching. Mm -hmm. And if the zone of teaching is, let's have this conversation, take another shot at this without a penalty, then that is 100% of the, of the faculty member's authority to determine. Mm -hmm. If the faculty member is saying, I do feel like it wouldn't be fair unless, if, I if I didn't impose a late penalty, or I am now reflecting on this and realizing I really like this student and that's kind of why I wanna give him or her another chance. Um, or uh, this student has a similar experience to what I had. And so I'm gonna let them kind of take another shot at this. And that's when some of the sort of sticky bias related questions might come into play. And that's when I think um, our office doesn't know what we don't know. Uh, so we can help work through some of those questions Questions like, would I make this opportunity available to everyone in my class if the same thing happened tomorrow with another student? Um, and also, um, am I prepared for the repercussions of what sort of what this looks like? For, so for some faculty, um, you know, it creates another amount of work, right? I have to reevaluate, I have to grade this or I have to put comments on this again. Um, and then 
There are tentacles there that reach out for students too. If it's a 12 page paper and the faculty member says, I want you to take another shot at this, have it to me by tomorrow with no plagiarism. Um, you may have inadvertently created another situation. You, you may have kind of had some ripple effects that were not intentional, but um, are important to think about. And so those are things that sort of we can help talk through at any, at any point, but just to kind of highlight, you know, what the code requires in terms of responsibility um, and rights of faculty members. Um, I think that's important to get to. Thanks for bringing it up. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I want to look through quickly. Um, Betsy put a couple of things in the in the chat that I'll refer to. I mentioned Lance Eaton's policies, which are linked on SharePoint, but she put the link right in here, so you can check that out. Um, the um, the SharePoint is linked in there. Thanks for Betsy for posting to Betsy for posting that too. Um, Jessica mentions equal access to these tools. I think that's another real. I'm really glad you brought that up, and it's something I think we need to think and and talk more about because some of these, this is gonna to change too, right? Like some of these tools are free right now. Um, some of the tools are not free and students are paying to use them. And so what kind of dynamic does that does that create? I think that's um, probably part of a next round of conversations that I'd, I'd really like to have. Um, these slides will be available on the SharePoint and CTRL will distribute them. I think that gets that comments. Betsy, I see you have a hand up. So building on Caron, thank you. This is so great. Thank you. Building on Caron's point, we had a case, I know of a case, the student used ChatGPT in the fall, was caught, was told if they did it again, it would be a suspension. They did it again in the spring. The only way, and then they were suspended. So the only way that we know that is because the faculty member in both cases submitted it to the, you know, and now in this case to your office. So I feel caught between using it as a teaching moment and submitting it to your office. Help me out. That's great. Thanks, Betsy. I feel like this gets at a really um, complicated, in some ways like emotional response maybe for some. And I, I wanna use this also to mention, um, Brad Knight's been working on uh, some getting some experts to campus to talk about kindness and the pedagogy of kindness. And I want to use this as a way to kind of um, inquire about to what extent is our decision to execute as our decision as a faculty member to execute a sort of teaching moment with a student based in some perception of kindness versus um, a, a pedagogical intention or a, a kind of identification of a teaching zone, so to speak, right? Sometimes it, I do think it's true and uh, as most of you know, I have concerns about the current academic integrity code. We're working through those and we haven't resolved those yet. That's an okay thing. We're working together. Things will change. Um, but uh, the question of what kind of education happens when the AIC process is followed, like the case gets officially reported, is there something a student learns from that? And I would say, yes, there is. It's, this is really serious. This has university-wide implications. Our commitment to a community and to an academic citizenship that we're all kind of sharing on some level um, matters. Um, there, there are consequences for this kind of, um, whether it's a mistake or uh, it's a disregard for policies, et cetera. Whatever the reason is, um, there are potentially consequences. And sometimes those have learning implications, right? And so uh, for a faculty member to say, I think the zone of learning, I think the best way for students to for a student to learn from this is to get another shot at it. I feel like they missed the boat on how we talked about paraphrasing, or I feel like it wasn't clear to them how this tool could be used responsibly. I want them to try again. Is trying again going to give them another opportunity to sort of to, to learn, or is it kind of, I don't want them to go through the process because that's gonna feel bad. And I feel like I'm not being a kind person by sort of sending them through the process. Um, and so I guess I wanna, I've been thinking about that question a lot about sort of like where kindness can be found in the academic integrity process. Is, is it also kind potentially to move a case to our office? Um, and, and how does our potential 
concern with being kind um, maybe sometimes send us in the wrong direction. Um, and so I know um, Brad is planning uh, some more hearty discussions about kindness. And so and it, um, if you have something to put in the chat or you wanna jump in Brad to, to advertise, um, I'd love for people to know about it. Announcement coming soon on that. I, mm -hmm. I can't share the, the date yet, uh, but contract is nearly signed. Expect an event in late September. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot like no, that. No, that's okay. That's great. <laughs> happy to happy to make the plug. Yeah, thanks. Are there other questions or um, things that anybody wants to bring up, things we should be thinking about as we consider um, potentially more workshops, areas of support, um, tools, guidance that you'd like to see? I have a question, Allison, again, sorry, it's Karan. It's kind of self-interested um, for us as, as I said, our, our staff of peer consultant tutors. So we're looking at student writing in a draft stage. We will historically, or typically, we will flag a paper that we feel has some of those things that you talked about, uh, tone changes or unsighted sources and we refer to the professor that we're working with, hey, you might want to have a conversation with this student. Just We're just not sure about this paper. Um, I really don't want our tutoring staff to be chat GPT detectives. We are not going to kind of waste time running papers through those devices. I mean, we might if they worked, or we could be 100% sure, but we can't. What would be a best practice for us vis-a-vis -vis faculty? The same thing we've always done, just, hey, there's just something about this paper, um, we can kind of see from using ChatGPT that it has that kind of five paragraph essay feeling to it. There's a certain tone it has. Do we do training with our tutors to start to recognize that? And that becomes a flaggable, hey, professors might wanna know this mm -hmm. or what? So one of the things that uh, you and I talk, have talked about a few times that I think is relevant to share with everyone is um, this idea that these tools sometimes produce things that look good and then actually they're not really that good. Um, I mean, we've heard, probably seen uh, reports about ChatGPT passing the bar exam or um, ChatGPT producing a serviceable kind of B minus essay uh, or something like that. Um, but, uh, but oftentimes, there, there are other things that might raise flags, right? Like the source isn't real or um, this paper is disorganized or, and it might be because it's generated by a, an artificial intelligence tool. And like you said, a tutor may not know that or may not really be in the position to be investigating that. But you and I have talked about, and I think what's cool about um, some of the collaboration we've done is allowing the tutors and the student leaders in that moment to say, before the thing gets started, before this tutoring relationship begins, um, did you use any tools to help you with this? Is this, was, did you use any generative AI tools? What are some of the rules about that? And so not in a kind of accusatory or like um, confidentially as your lawyer, please tell me if you committed the crime kind of way. Um, but I think one thing that uh, you brought up to me was and I've heard from a lot of students is like, I don't want to read a paper that was generated by AI. Like that's a waste of my time. I'm supposed to be helping you. And, and so the sort of like taking it personally really kind of goes back to what um, Arielle Bernstein was saying during our plenary session about sort of um, the movie Her and how nobody wants love letters that have been generated by a machine. Or I talked to a student group today about, um, uh, I said, what if I wrote a recommendation letter for you and use chat GPT, would you be okay with that? And they were sort of like, no, because I'm, I'm me and that's personal and it should be specific. You should like me better than that, or you should appreciate me more than that. Right. And so I think for student leaders and students uh, who are in positions um, like your um, tutoring staff to say, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. This is legitimately created 100% by you, or this is following your course guidelines, or this is 
in adhering to your professor's expectations, right? Um, and that gives, you know, it doesn't mean you won't, that it won't happen, but I do think it's, it teaches everybody something about their relationship. Um, I don't know if that addresses. Well, it has them interrogating their use of it, which I don't know that, I think that's a skill we have to kind of teach students. And that's what I'm excited about for this summer. Yeah. You know, culmination in the fall to think about if I'm using it, why am I using it? What is that specific use? Because I think that's realistic for when they're going to be in the workplace and they're making yeah. some of the same decisions, though a different setting, not academic, but okay. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Karen. Um, Lynn. Yeah. Hey, Allison. First, thanks so much for this session. It's been really interesting. And I really appreciate the fact that you're heading up the academic integrity, um, you know, this, this new office and everything like that, um, your enthusiasm. I hope it doesn't wane uh, over the next year or so. Um, but I wanted to say, I th what I think is really um, the spirit of what you said, both in the lunch plenary and now, is I think one of how do we get buy-in, right? So we've always had to get buy-in from students about any kind of plagiarism because they're, they're going to be students who, who do that, you know? But the idea is like, how do we get them to say, and I love the examples that you provided of the, um, of the you know, what if I did my your letter of recommendation with Ch Chad GPT? And also kind of tying in um, like ways that I think faculty with maybe a, an upper division class where they're using Chat GPT to like, okay, well, I want my students to do this and then find out how it's like their problems with it or that sort of thing. But you need the skill set to begin with. And I think that, so there's a difference between like maybe a 100, 200 level class, like you said, with the addition and a calculator that you gotta know how to add to make sure that what you're getting with the calculators, you, know, you can spot check it or, that, or did you forget to put a number in or something like that, which I often do. <laughs> but um, so that, I think those are maybe the ways of doing it. And instead of a us versus them I, is, and I kind of think back to when we had Wikipedia or something like that, where it's like, it was like, oh my God, Wikipedia, everyone's gonna use it. And then we found out like, well, it's a good place to give a quick check. And then, but then you want to do your own research or maybe it will help you narrow down that sort of thing. But then how do you use it and being clear and getting people, um, I think the base of the buy-in from the students to like understand, the limits and like how we want to use it in our classes and then also i think uh, there might be great cl classes that in, in an advanced way allow them to check it and just say okay what are the biases or what are the limitations because i know i've run some of my assignments through chat gpt and there are things that i'm just like in two seconds i can say this is wrong but i think a student who's an in, you know a intro level student wouldn't see that they'll be like wow that sounds really good and it, it, it isn't so I think that buy-in and so the more examples to provide of that I think it would be really helpful um, and then obviously you know faculty identifying where it's you know works and where it doesn't work for them but but I just wanted to say thank you for this conversation it's been really helpful. Thanks thank you so much I really appreciate that comment too about um, what students might be seeing when they're getting some output um, and I feel like a lot of media has positioned, you know, the future is here and the machines are so smart. Um, there's like this, this sense that I think a lot of students have that like, this is really powerful. This is really doing good stuff. Um, and I, I think inviting students to be critical and to think critically about sort of what is it, what are the implications of it, I think are, are really useful conversations. Um, how to use a tool is hard if we ourselves as faculty sort of like don't know how to use it or haven't experimented with it ourselves it's okay to not know those things um and i think kind of engaging with students on that level that sort of like curiosity or let's see what this does or let's see what the issues are with this um before making decisions in into it i think too about um with the calculator example like at some point i took a math class i don't know how i got into it some advanced class that required the use of a graphing calculator but i did and I needed to be taught how to use a graphing calculator. It was like looking at another another language entirely. It was a tool I didn't know how to use. I needed to be sort of guided in how to use it to, to do what I needed it to do. And so, um, and think through sort of when is this okay to use and when is this substituting for my own work? So um, Brad, I think I see your hand. Is that from Yeah, me? yeah, I wanted to expand the conversation about trust and how we develop that with students to consider also how we model it in our course design. You talked about some of the conditions that set students up to 
uh, lead to their choices that uh, violate the academic integrity code. Uh, and I think about not just that piece of it, but also the signals of uh, the use of courseware, which increasingly removes the professor from the equation and, and students are uh, submitting homework and getting feedback from these this courseware without the instructor's relationship that we were talking about being a part of it. But then building that even out further, what are the conditions that uh, might have led that instructor to adopt that courseware? So thinking also about how as an institution, we have to prioritize and value small classes to create the conditions where we don't need to make use of, of things like the courseware, which sort of create this domino effect that makes the challenge of, of conveying this message to students all the more difficult. Yeah, that's great. That's a really great point. Um, I think I think the relationship questions and then the questions of sort of like labor and priorities are, especially, I mean, I've heard a lot from faculty about sort of labor related questions and, and how, how do I prioritize this and this and this and this and this. I mean, this sort of like fatigue and, and the experience of having, you know, like built a flame, what's the, the expression, building a plane and flying it too um, during, during COVID for, for, some, for some of us. Um, I think there's a, there's a throwback to that, I think. Um, I think there's another hand. I see um, Rhonda's comment in the chat. What about a hybrid assignment generated by chat GPT and modified by the student or modify the assignment, ask the student to write the prompts and show the original chat GPT. This all seems interesting and cool to me. I mean, I hope um, Betsy's session can, I mean, I feel like Betsy will speak to some of those things. Betsy, do you wanna um, jump in on that question? Yeah, that's what we're going to discuss in my session. I was going to ask you, which is, that's the kind of thing, Rhonda, that faculty are doing, uh, are suggesting. But Allison, I wanted you to go back to this question of building trust and uh, this question, assumption of cheating and sort of move and try to move away from that. And we've talked about this sort of the moral versus the psychological judgments. You want to say something about that? Maybe again? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. I think... Um... One of the things that our attention to AI is doing, as in it, one of the things it's doing is really bringing to the surface some of the conversations that I've seen in academic integrity research for a while that um, a lot of institutions have sort of like, um, I don't want to suggest it's necessarily deliberate, but there's a kind of earmuffing um, of, of the research uh, on this, uh, on academic integrity. A lot of institutions have sort of like delayed or put band-aids on their policies and, um, and programs related to academic integrity for a long time. But the research has been out there. And amongst the things um, that a lot of experts have said about academic integrity work, and these are experts from um, interdisciplinary conversations, uh, Re uh, education researchers, psychology researchers, sociology researchers, um, philosophy, rhetoric, um, uh, law. Um, uh, this question of sort of academic integrity as a moral issue and that a code violation equals a moral failing um, is something that uh, to me, the most exciting research and the research amongst the experts that um, I assess to really be um, valuable contributors to this conversation. Uh, th that that moral question is not a, not as useful as questions about our educational responsibilities and about academic integrity as part of an educational ecosystem. That academic integrity is a set of skills and concepts um, that can be taught. That's related to information literacy, digital literacy. Um, no, AI literacy, um, it's related to research skills and habits, it's related to study skills and habits, organization, management of projects, um, all kinds of things that are uh, habits of mind oriented thinking has kind of directed us to and we've sort of um, not really met that moment, uh, I think, until, until now we're ready um, to sort of to, to meet that moment and address sort of how 
is and how should academic integrity be part of us executing our obligations as an educational institution rather than an institution that catches cheaters, um, accuses someone of being a bad person. I don't know, I think almost every single meeting I've ever had with a student um, at some point includes the student saying, I'm not a bad person. This is not who I am. This is not how I was raised. Um, and I find those, uh, it's really hard to hear those statements because in those moments, um, they get in the way, they distract from real learning that could be happening in these moments. And so um, I think, I, I think, I don't know if that like gets too, too deep in the weeds to your question, Betsy, but was that kind of what you were thinking yeah, about? Yeah, exactly. I mean, sort of building on what Brad was saying, I think it's, um, you know, I can give people citations if they're interested from a book I recently read on, it's called Cheating and Academic Integrity, 30 Lessons from 30, Lessons from 30 Years of Research by David Rettinger and Tradisha Bertram Gavant. And, and it basically, they say, you know, at some point in their careers, you know, 90% of students will cheat. But on any given day, very few people cheat. And they cheat um, be probably because they don't know it's cheating or because they feel like faculty are disorganized, assignments don't feel relevant, they're so open-ended that they just sort of lend themselves to copy and pasting from the internet. And so, or if they feel that the professor is, is, uh, is biased and not fair to them. And so they, um, they will not buy into the student learning because they don't feel the faculty member is doing their part. So I'd sort of, I want to shift it like back to sort of what's our part in this, in this dance, if you will, going back to Brad's point about building trust and about AI, it really goes back to, I said this at the plenary, which is we need to be very clear what's allowed and what's not allowed in our courses because of the mixed messages that students will be getting. So the other thing is they said that, uh, um, you know, so we have need is, uh, the only other thing I'd say is struck as scaffold assignments, because time, as you say, time management is a reason that people, they feel they get caught. So if you can scaffold assignments and break them up into little bits so that people can actually succeed and do them, there'll be less cheating, if you will. And um, the other thing is if, you know, faculty, if students have other priorities or time commitments and they can't do the assignment. So if we have some compassion and are open within reason, I mean, this there's, I've talked to a lot of faculty, this opens a door. It's like, if you, you know, cause it's, you have to be fair there, you know, you have to be consistent, but flexible. So if someone comes to you and says that they have a this personal crisis going on, well, what the next person you have to have, have the same policies, same, that you offer to others. Otherwise you can be accused of racism, sexism, you know, whatever it is. So that would be my two cents. I do think one of the things I wanna pluck out of um, something you said in terms of like our responsibility as faculty to students is um, checking our assumptions. This is not an easy thing to do because sometimes we're in our own bubbles and it's hard to imagine that a student might not think the way we assume they think about something or have had the experiences that we may have assumed that they've that they've had. Um, and so, you know, uh, maybe to me, it seems obvious that um, using a Chegg to get help on a math problem, like I paste my math homework question into Chegg and let the community of users offer me their responses. Um, and then I somehow, you know, make use of it. And as a student, it may not seem like an obvious problem there. To me, my first thought is that is an obvious problem, right? But, uh, but that's based on some assumptions about the students' experiences. And so the more I can be transparent about that, the more I can dig into that. Um, one of the examples I gave this morning, uh, at my in my conversation with students was um uh, I was with my niece who was in 11th grade she was doing her geometry homework uh, and she had her phone out and she was working with her pencil on her paper and then she looked at her phone and I was like hey what are you doing on your phone over there uh, and she was like I'm using this math app that um that that I'm checking like I'm checking my work and I was like huh 
And the minute I said it like that, she was sort of like, oh, geez, I need to leave the room. Auntie is the worst to hang out with when I'm doing homework because she's the academic integrity robot. Um, and so uh, what I said to her was like, well, what are you gonna do with your answer when you get an answer from your phone, whatever your phone is doing, what are you gonna do with what you receive from the phone vis-a-vis -vis your own work? And she's like, well, if it's wrong, I'm gonna change it. And to me, it was very obvious, like that was very obviously problematic. It was not very obvious to her. And in this conversation I had with students, they were sort of like, yeah, but she needs to get the question right. And I was like, aha, now we're really getting to the issue. And so the students said, you know, uh, we get that the professor is using this to determine how capable we are of completing this particular math problem. And we get that we're probably gonna be asked to use the skills that those problems assess on the next assessment. But the fact remains that this project is due and I need to do well on it. And this is how I've been sort of taught to learn. So students were kind of exposing this sort of like, I feel like that's part of how we're taught to learn. I feel like these tools have become have been part of my high school experience in ways that professors don't really understand or appreciate. Um, and to that, my question was, did you learn to use these tools or did you use these tools? And that kind of, unearthed some deeper and conversation where they were all kind of like, ooh, maybe I forgot what it's called math photo or something like that. Um, maybe that's not the way to use that tool. Or maybe I need to talk to my professor to see if it is a tool. And I don't know that all of our faculty know that tools like that are just sort of attached to the fingers, right? Um, so a math picks. Thank you, Catherine. Math picks. That's exactly what it was. Um, so thanks for uh, entertaining that story. I'm going to tell my niece that um, she's famous. <laughs> I know there's a um, there's a session evaluation. I think Teddy put it up on the screen. We could put it up again if we need to. Yes. Um, I think, yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions before we take off to head to Betsy's session? I would ask whether anybody has their policy for AI written yet. And if so, could they put it in the chat box for us to take a look at? So we have a God style guide for writing research and public speaking and Allison and her staff helped us rewrite the whole academic integrity page so as a center that's our policy and I'm happy to send it along for for others to see um I did have a quick question that just kind of flew out of my head so give me a second oh I remembered what it was um I shared this in the plenary lunch yesterday about who our AU students are. Um, there's an interesting fact in the career counseling world right now that employers in 2018 considered college GPA a major indicator of their new hires worthiness. Um, upwards of 73, 74% were looking at that as a major indicator. In the last year for which there's data 2022, that number has dropped to 36% importance. So from 73 to 36%, and employers are looking at new hires for their, along holistic measures, communication skills, critical thinking, teamwork, time management, work ethic. So I, I'd kind of like that to get out to our students who are so GPA focused and I have to get an A and I'll do anything to do it, um, that start to think about the value of your co-curricular activities and of showing up um, and developing your, your emotional intelligence and 
your collaboration, your DEI mindset, those things really matter. If you can tell a story about them and show activities in college linked to that, it's going to make a big difference. Um, that number is expected to fall about the importance of straight GPA. Thanks. I see Christina put some language in the chat. I feel like, um, I think I've seen I feel like I've seen this before. This is one that I do think um, has some specific um, acknowledgement of things like substitution of, like if you're substituting, um, yeah, uh, it says assistive AI are powerful tools for generating text. They should not be used as a substitute for your own understanding, analysis, or composition of course text. Um, that's that's probably one of the most common sentiments or ideas that I've seen in all of the policies that I've looked at. If I, if I had to sort of draw out a commonality, this idea that um, these tools shouldn't be substitutes for your own understanding, analysis, your learning, um, uh, your learning. Thanks for posting that. All right. With that, shall we shall we disband and reunite? Um, Fifteen minutes hence in session eight hundred one. Thank you all so much uh, for taking the time. If there are questions you wanted to ask, but you wanted to wait on, if you want to get in touch by email, please do. If you want to get involved in any kind of academic integrity work, whether it's um, serving on academic integrity code panels or uh, being part of a group of folks doing some outreach if it's participating in developing the new code um, i would really love to work with you so thanks so much